Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 177. This episode is with the fantastic and talented Elias Tufexis. You may know him best as Adam Jensen in the Deus Ex games, Kenzo in The Expanse, Frederico or Leonidas in the Assassin's Creed games, or from more than a hundred other projects. Elias is so cool, and I had a great time getting to know him. In this episode, we talk about him growing up in Montreal, being inspired by Kenneth Branagh to become an actor, taking a chair to the head while wrestling, his love of theater, how he combats imposter syndrome, signing the Golden Book of Montreal with William Shatner, and he also gives some practical advice on how to make a living as an actor, and so much more. Elias is awesome, and you're in for a good one. So, without further ado, please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 177, with Elias Tufexis. Theme song time. the world are you today because you travel a lot yeah but today i'm in i'm home in la back home in la cool yeah. cool well i'm in la i don't really live in la i live outside of la like sure, ju- sure. like about 40 minutes from the city gotcha. like whoever nobody goes to the city yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's i learned that the first time i went that there's like la and then there's la county and la county is like 80 subcultures yeah it's really big so yeah we live i live out in woodland hills Nice, yeah. nice. But I also know you're Canadian. I am, yeah. I grew up in Montreal. Nice. What is Montreal like? I've not been there. It's uh, in the summer from, uh-huh. let's say, May to September. It's the greatest city in North America. Okay, okay. It's I like just it. every possible food you could possibly want. Every week there's another giant festival. The city's 400 years old, so... Dude. There's a whole big chunk of the city that is uh, un- unchanged, really, for the most part, architecturally. Sure. Uh, called Old Montreal, beautiful churches and uh, architecture. And the city's amazing, full of culture, very multicultural. There's a Chinatown and a oh, cool. Jewish district. And a, it's just amazing. Every sort of food, best city in the world. But then it gets cold. <laughs> and when it gets cold from mid-september to freaking march april it's Ooh. it's like almost unbearable at times it's oh so God. cold but it gets so hot in the summer so it's really it's uh i've experienced both i've actually been hotter in montreal than i have been well, that's not exactly true i was gonna say that i have been in la but <laughs> i live in i live in woodland hills sure and woodland hills gets up to like 120 at times it's ridiculous oh. yeah oh it's crazy so that's uh that's not true anymore but Montreal can get pretty hot but it also gets really really cold goodness great what's the coldest you've been uh I don't know what this would be Fahrenheit but I remember like you can get with the wind chill factor it was like uh minus 45 Celsius <gasps> yeah with the wind chill fact with the wind chill I think it only goes down to ever really you know minus 25 is like the most it goes Celsius the funny thing about <laughs> Fahrenheit and Celsius is Fahrenheit and Celsius start matching up when you get to the minuses. Oh God. Like, minus. It's so funny. Yeah. Minus Elias. That's not yeah. how it's supposed to be. But I was just in New uh, up in New York shooting a show and uh it was like seven degrees, six degrees freezing. Woo-hoo! Just absolutely freezing up there. And I'd forgotten because I've been living in LA all spoiled. Sure, yeah. Your blood's thinned out a little bit. Yeah. Where are you? Uh I'm in Florida. Ah, but I'm, I'm I'm originally from North Carolina and I feel ashamed of myself because my blood is thinned out to the point where when it's 60 degrees, I'm like, oh, it's cold in here. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, that's how my son is. My, my yeah. son is well, I've only been in LA like four years, but it's half of his life. Right. And so uh he's now completely like he'll wake up here and it's you know 68 degrees, it's like it's freezing. Yeah. Are you crazy? <laughs> Right. Why do we live here, Dad? You're like, you don't even. Know. I was born in snow. <laughs> yeah, I was literally born into snow. Yeah, <laughs> I've seen those videos of how Canadians are born. They yeah. just pull you out of the snow. <laughs> Can you confirm that is real? Uh, it is not real. Oh, uh, we no don't dodge flying hockey pucks. 
Oh, and, okay, cool, uh, cool. <laughs> there's half, there's, it's like fables have some truth in them. Yeah, Jim Carrey has a great bit about that, about how he used to, when, when people would ask him if he's Canadian, and they say, oh, it must have been cold, then he just goes with it. He decides <laughs> to run with it, and he says things like, my good friend Nan took and I would burrow a hole in the snow <laughs> and look out for hockey pucks, things like that. It's none of that's true. It's just it's a, hockey pucks in the wild. It's just the same. <laughs> that's one thing I found being all over North America is that in and of itself, every city is the same. Like you have the the cores of the cities which are, which are different. Like Boston has a feel, and New York, New York is especially has a feel, and LA has a feel. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you get to like the suburbs, every city is exactly the same. I'm driven yeah. across America, back and forth, and uh, they're all the same. Yeah. The, the Targets and the WalMarts and the yeah. <laughs> same restaurants, all that same stuff. Sure, there's food and there's people. The same thing in Canada, Toronto, Montreal. It's all like that. There you go. There you go. See, now I have it built in my head. Like, have you seen Book of Boba Fett? I have. So, you know, where there's like Tuscan Raiders and they're like digging through the sand and finding those like pods? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. I the picture Canadians. Bible. That's how you find the hockey pucks. Yes. That's what <laughs> <Just> <laughs> we all have a sixth sense. And yeah. Figure it out of that. <laughs> yeah it's your rite of passage as a Canadian. You just, <laughs> ah, have you, has he found his puck yet? <laughs> I am the funny thing is as cliche as it is, I am a giant hockey fan. Of course. And, uh, What's your team? Montreal Canadiens. Have to be, right? Yeah. Legally, I think. But hey, you're I don't know if you follow hockey, but the Panthers this year are incredible. And you know, Panthers, you know? Yep. Can't go wrong. Can't <laughs> go wrong. Yeah, I, I learned early on as a kid, uh, sports teams, you, it, there's the ultimate highs and the ultimate lows. And you gotta watch who you uh, tie your identity to. But you can't go wrong with hometown because at the very least, you could be like, you know, it is what it is. Like the Cleveland Browns have learned time and time again. It's ride or die. Yeah, exactly. I get it. Did you play uh, hockey? I'm just not a very good skater. I like, yeah. I'm, I'm very bad at skating. And, uh, Same. I played baseball. Nice. Uh, well, we used to have the Montreal Expos when I was a kid. Right. I used to have the Expos team and I was a fat giant fan of those, but cool. uh, of that team, but uh, they left in, 90, in 2004. Sure. And became the Washington Nationals and then went and won a World Series. <laughs> so we're not too happy about that. Yeah, that's how, that's how it goes. So playing baseball, when did your interest in entertainment start? Always. I mean, I always put it as like uh, when I first saw Star Wars, I think I just wanted to be like, that's where I want to be. Yeah. You know same. what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I didn't know exactly what it was, I don't think. Sure. Where I knew, you know, I think I knew, you know, it's six or seven years old uh, when I first saw it. I think I, I would have seen it. It would have been before VHSs and stuff. So if I, when I was six, so it would have been probably went to the theater to see it. Like when they kept re-releasing it. Sure. I wouldn't have been. I, mean, I, I, I actually don't remember the first time I saw Star Wars. I remember. Yeah, it must have been like two or three two maybe lining up for return of the jedi nice or something like that i remember like doing around the block for that but i don't remember star wars but whatever. my point is like i saw luke skywalker and i wanted to be luke skywalker i hear you and uh, whatever that was was what i wanted to do and then i would learn about it and learn about you know being in film and being in movies and and, 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 and acting and for, for me and until i was really like an early teenager i really just thought it was super fun like go to space type thing not sure. literally but like super fun yeah of course and then i think i was uh 14 or 15 and i saw kenneth Branagh's henry the fifth and my fantastic. uncle had, had it playing and uh i credit that movie and Branagh specifically with completely changing the trajectory of my career life yeah. or my life choices in my career because I, I saw that and I didn't understand it, but I was like, well, how do I do this? And then that started me looking into theater and Shakespeare and all these old other authors and, and uh, particularly authors of play, like playwrights particularly. Sure. And uh, then that got me to go to theater school instead of like my original plan, which was like, just try to go to Hollywood and make movies and like I sure think about all that. <laughs> but i went to theater school and that changed a lot because then i did theater for you know 10 years of my life right before i even got into doing any sort of on camera or, or audio or anything like that and 
like, yeah, it formed a lot of my personality. It formed a lot of my thinking about acting. So really just seeing that movie, Kenneth Brown's movie changed so much uh, in terms of my career. That's so cool. At the power of art, man. It can yeah, do that. It really is. Yeah. Very I love true. it. Did you, so then did you want to be an actor or a professional wrestler first? <laughs> no, wrestling <laughs> was, uh, I was, I've always been a giant wrestling fan. I haven't watched it much recently, but, uh, sure. when I was a kid, you know, like I was, I was a kid, kid, just as like the Hogan era was ending, Ooh. like the eighties era was ending. Uh, -huh. uh, so I still got to see, I remember going to Montreal to see Hogan what? and Brutus Beefcake. What? I was really, I was really young, but I have this memory of it still. Dude. Uh, and then I really got into wrestling uh, in the early 90s when it started. Uh, not in the early 90s, the mid 90s, like Bret Hart and then on to the crazy uh, Stone Cold and The Rock kind of stuff. Yeah. But I was so into it that my, fr my friends and I were also into it that we actually hired this guy out of Montreal called the Mark Le Grizzly, which is Mark Le Grizzly, Great. Uh, who was like a 350 pound guy with like, he's this giant bearded, huge wrestler. Yeah. And he, we hired him to train us for a couple of weeks. And, and then we rented, we all pulled, pulled our money and rented a ring. <laughs> Sweet. And put on a show. No one was there. There was like 30 of course. people. Or whatever. But we put on a wrestling show. We all had a little plan and uh, I was in a tag team, but I was uh, the tag team was Twisted Steel and Sex Appeal. Ooh, that was the tag I love team. it. And I was Twisted Steel. Nice. And uh, I took chairs off the head and things like that. And it was really what? fun. And then, then we went and did it for another few weeks. We would do these like, we would join up with these independent shows in Montreal and kind of go have fun with those. But uh, I, would, I never really intended it to be a career or anything. It was just something I really, really liked. That's so uh, cool. And I knew I, it was so funny. I remember the first time doing a match and not being able to stop smiling. Yeah. Even though my character was a bad guy. Because <laughs> right. I was like, this is so much fun. Right. <laughs> and then you get body slammed and it kills. So it's yeah. stops making you smile. But uh, but yeah, that was my only really foray into wrestling. It was never something I was really going to pursue. But like my uncle through marriage is Mad Dog Vachon. What? Yeah. Uh, I never actually had met him. But I met his brother a few times. But still... Uh, yeah, so and Montreal has a really big connection to wrestling. Dude. Uh, so uh, I, I had that that connection there, but again, it was not, I, I never even intended. Like, this is just for fun. I'm not going to, it hurts too much. It yeah. just hurts too much. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, but man, Oof. like that first day they're handing out Advils and cold packs. Yeah. <laughs> because they're like, you're going to be in super amounts of pain by the end of the day. Oh, like, oh okay. Well, you said chair to the head. That's uh... Yeah, I took a chair to the head. I actually Ooh. did a a Halloween show where they put a pumpkin on my head and he hit the pumpkin <laughs> like four times. I, I was love like, oh, it. whatever, I can take it. I'll never do that now. It's fine. When it's I was fine. like 17, I'm like, oh yeah, I want to do it. See, I like to believe that there is this alternate reality where Twisted Steel, the smiling heel exists. You know? <laughs> Twisted Steel, the smiling heel. You I know? <laughs> I'm, yeah. here for, I'm here for you. We can figure this out. It's so funny because I have so many good ideas. I wish I would meet. I've met a bunch of wrestlers. I never would have the audacity to be like, I got this really good idea. <laughs> but I've met a bunch of them at Comic-Cons and things like that. And I would love to just sit down with one and go, I got this great idea for a bit, for a comp, for like, a, not so much moves, but like the entertainment aspect of it. Yeah. Like I got this great idea for a, for a, a promo here. And I got this great idea for a catchphrase. Maybe one day. Yeah. I mean, hey, you never know. Freddie Prince Jr. is really involved in it, and he used to write for WWE. So oh, yeah. <laughs> just saying, it's all theater. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's all theater. You know, I get it. I understand. We'll come, we'll we'll make a duo where I'll just be like your gopher and I'll I'll be the middleman. Like, Go talk to that guy and tell me you have an idea. And I'm like, all right, cool. <laughs> you know, I'll be your I'll yeah. be your buffer. Yeah, I like I can't even name. I was gonna say get somebody. I can't even name a wrestler now. Edge, he's still around. Yeah, there you uh, go. Mick Foley's yeah. still alive. He's still alive. They're all still alive. <laughs> yeah. But or not actually with wrestling, that's a bold statement. Facts. Uh, but uh yeah, Stone Cold and Mick Foley and Shawn Michaels and they're all still alive. And of course the rock. I love also these connections that my brain is now making because you actually do a really good Stone Cold impression. I've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> On that, yeah, that, what was that show? What was that show? Shadow, Shadow Hunters. Shadow Hunters, yeah. Mm -hmm. God, that was an experience, man. I the bet. Bump. A buddy of mine was uh, 
the showrunner for that show. Cool. And he, I had done uh, alphas with him. Yeah. My first movie ever I did, he cast me in. So we were good friends and he called me and he goes, look, I need somebody to play like the demon version of one of the main characters. And I know you have a movement background and you do a lot of performance capture. It's not that it's makeup, but it's like two hours of makeup. Can't pay you very much. Can you come in and do it? Oh, I feel like he's lying. It's not that he was lying. He was just (laughs) not up on on the facts. Sure. (laughs) And it was like, I think they probably told him what he told me. And then I got there and it was eight hours of makeup. Uh. Standing there with like (laughs) nothing on but like a G-string. Getting completely covered, which is embarrassing enough. You get completely covered in that. Sorry, there's my shadow toy. You get to completely covered in this this latex all over your body. And then it was eight hours to get on and then four hours to get off every day. Plus it's like a 16 hour shoot day. And I was getting paid peanuts. Oh no, that's half the day. Yeah, oh my God, I hated hated every second of that. Uh, But it was fun to, I thought I looked like a burnt stone cold. Yeah, (laughs) you did. (laughs) Yeah. That's nuts. Eight eight and four, that's 12. There's only 24 of those. Yeah, so I would work I would work like 18 hour, 20 hour days. It, thankfully, it was only like four days or something. If I oh, I was just about but even answer. by the second day, I was like, like, I'm going to, I want to quit. Right. I hate everything <laughs> about this. What have I done? Yeah. Oh. I remember they, they needed to pick up another like shot mm-hmm. after, like two weeks later. And I remember going, is it like, is it a hand shot? Are they only going to shoot the top of me? Do I know they need you to come to do everything. And I remember the night before not being able to sleep and having like anxiety about standing there for another eight hours. Yeah. And, and like, you know, I'm, uh, I've known people that have stand like my friend Doug, who was like the, the king of doing uh, makeup stuff. Oh yeah. Doug Jones. Doug, yeah. And uh, he's a really, really nice guy. And I called him and like, how do you like, mentally uh prepare for this and he's like you just shut down man you just kind of like shut it down oh Read smart. If you can, just not but also like he the thing about it was that bothered me was the character wasn't interesting it was just like a burnt version of this lead character so i was mostly just standing there i had like four or five lines mm-hmm. and i was doing a friend uh, like a favor for my friend so it was it was like i wasn't even enjoying the character so like right. trying to trying to like to zen myself out for eight hours to work for 10 hours doing something I didn't want to do anyway. Yeah. <laughs> for almost no money too. Right. I was like, no, nothing here is adding up to me being happy. Sure. Uh, even like the, 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 the idea that you're like, Hey, you should be grateful for No, I'm not grateful for this. <laughs> I wish I said no for this. This has been torture for four days. Now I gotta do it again. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mental fortitude. But I got that stone cold impression video. Out of it, so Honestly like worth it. Let's let's be honest. Where else are you gonna get it? I'm just saying you got to take mementos. Yeah, and I re- I respect it. <laughs> when when you're deciding, like, because it's very different to enjoy something and then to want to do it professionally, right? Yeah. It, was there a moment when you decided I want to do this professionally, like as far as acting goes? I don't remember that moment. I think it was just always the thing I was gonna do. Yeah. It, actually, it, it's funny. I the other day. I posted a picture, uh, a billboard for a Blade Runner. Uh, bl- uh, what's it called? Black Lotus. <laughs> what's right. It? I made it. I don't remember what it's called. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. There was a big billboard in New York, in Brooklyn, where I was shooting New Amsterdam, which is the show I was up shooting in, in Brooklyn. Right. And and I'm not kidding. It was like six blocks from where I used to live on the floor in Brooklyn on the floor in a basement in Brooklyn full of cockroaches and rats dude, trying to make it as an actor. Yeah. And here I am like 20 years later, it was about, and, and I'm under a billboard of a show I'm in shooting another show. Uh, and I'm going, and I'm like, I took the picture and I, I put it up on Instagram. And I said, this is a crazy coincidence. Like one of those, like, you don't give up on your dreams type thing. Yeah. And my friend Carrie, who went to theater school with me, she wrote on it. She wrote on it. Uh, it was no plan B to Fexes. Damn That's what she right. called me. She always just called me like no plan B. Yes. And, and which means something different now. <laughs> <it's very> true. <laughs> 
but I just never, I never had a plan B. It was always, this is what I'm doing. And I, I would not impart that advice like to my kids. Sure. I don't know that I would do that. I would be like, maybe, well, look, let's just find something you're good at. You at least can back up on this. Right. And, you know, and I never did that. It was always just, this is what I'm doing. Yeah. And so whatever it takes, that's what I'm doing. If I have to live in a dump because that's the only place I can afford, that's what I'm doing. If I have to, and then eventually it just, I mean, it's funny to say it worked out. It still worked out, but with every actor, it could all end in a year. Right. You know, like I have, COVID almost did it. Yeah, for real. COVID shut down four jobs that I had. Whew. And if it wasn't for uh, Immortals Phoenix Rising, mm-hmm. that game that I did out of, uh, out of Montreal, out of Quebec, actually, out of Quebec City, yeah. I was flying up before COVID and doing all this performance capture for that. And then COVID hit and they shut down the performance capture. And I thought, well, I'm losing that job. Ooh. And then I looked at my bank account and I said, if I don't work for the next, like, let's say this last seven months. Right. With the cost of living in Los Angeles, oh, we're going to be in big trouble. Yeah. Like big trouble. So that's always on the back of my mind as an actor. Sure. And the reason I bring up Phoenix, Phoenix Rising is because they, I always like giving them their credit is they Hell yeah. worked with me to make sure that my home sound booth was pro quality. Enough. Oh, that's cool. And they even paid me for the testing sessions. Dude. And good then, then they they had me work all summer on Phoenix Rising. And it saved, it literally saved. Like I probably would have moved in with like my mom or something. Sure. With, with my two kids and my wife. Like I yeah. just <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah. And and it saved me. And then also because of that, I had the sound booth. So this is a whole other conversation, but because of COVID. Right. I had that professional sound booth and I was able to make a living. Get it. But I it was almost really, really bad. But so that's always my point is that's always on my mind is a lot of people are like, yeah, you made it. I'm like, yeah, I do. I make a living as an actor. That's true. Uh, but every it's like any contract work. Right. It's all you freelance. Know, like, yeah, I have contract, I have contracts going into August. Right. Uh, but then for all intents and purposes, I don't. Anymore. Right. Uh, September, I'm unemployed. Sure. Uh, I'm mean, fired I, after every job. Yeah. I mean, I, thank goodness that hasn't happened. Every year has been like better than the last. Right. But Great. for all I know, it's all going to end. Sure. So I always have that in my mind. And I'm always like, <laughs> man, I'm always going like, you want to go with my wife's like, I want to go on vacation. I'm like, you really want to spend that like three grand? <laughs> what happens if, Sure. you know, and you're always kind of worried about that. And sure. My wife keeps bugging me about it, but that's the life of any sort of uh, freelance thing, right? It's just yeah, the way it is. Absolutely, and that's not even talking about the imposter syndrome. I'm sure. Imposter syndrome is a huge thing, man. <sighs> Every artist, right? It's just how yeah. it works, no matter what. It's. I'm trying. I'm actively trying to avoid it, like because I know it's happening. So yep. until you realize what it is, I think you can't really. What's that thing? And you can't attack a problem until you know what the problem is yep and imposter syndrome is every actor has it i'm sure but yeah like it's debilitating to me sometimes sure and so what i i i've been trying to do at least the last like four or five years maybe it's age and more wisdom and, and stuff like that kind of folding into into my character but it's like a, a perfect example is this new amsterdam that i went up to do i did two episodes on that show great and it's a cool show and everything, but what I had to realize for like a guest star actor like me, yeah, is I'm going up there to do a job and to get everything they need on camera and then leave and let them do the rest of the show. Sure. Ten years ago, it was go up, do a great job, make the director love me, make the writer love me, make the casting director love me, make sure everybody loves me because right. I need to work with them again. Sure. You know, and and make sure all the actors are friends with me and make sure not that I go up there and be rude or, or I, right. I'm like <laughs> ignoring anybody. I go up there and I'm polite, but I'm there to do a job now. Sure. So anything I, anything I do now is I go there, I do the job. I'm going to do a good job so that the actual uh, outcome of all of this is when they watch the show, he did a good job and he was nice and he showed up on time and he knew his lines. 
And it, sure. it wasn't hit me coming in there hoping that every take was the one that they really like that's gonna like really get them to like me more. And it, it stopped being that. That's how I fight imposter syndrome. I just I know I'm good at my job and I'm just gonna go and do my job. Hell yeah. That's the only way to fight imposter syndrome. I love that. It's like the because the, the job and the technique and the skills, you're still doing the same thing, but the motivation mentally is different. Yeah. And you wouldn't have gotten the job if you weren't good. I love that. Like even if you weren't or good or right for the role or whatever, but like it, there's there was a scene. Actually, I shouldn't talk about this scene yet. I'm like, <laughs> so I won't get into specifics. I think it airs like next month. So sure. There's things. There's things, <laughs> things that happen. <laughs> things that happen and happen. But the audition scene I did at home with my wife, which is how I do most of my auditions. And uh, especially now with COVID and stuff. Sure. Great ace. Uh, so I did the audition. I did it. I did it like one take and I just sent it because I just felt it as I as I did it. Yeah. And they loved it and they, they booked me based on that audition. And then when I got there, they're like, your audition was really good. I, I loved everything you did. And, and then I, you have to try to replicate that when you're doing the actual scene. But the situation is so different right. than me with my wife knocking some lines off. Sure. That I had to like, I have things like, how am I going to get into that zone again where I'm like, just be that, just be in the moment of that character and, you know what I mean? Like it's really, really sure. tricky. And so I did it, and we're on like we do, you know, many takes for different camera angles and different coverage and things like that. And they were all like, "Great, great job, great job." And that that little guy in your in your head goes, "That was never as good as the audition. Right? It was never as good. <laughs> They're yeah. gonna hate it. They're gonna edit me out of this this episode." Sure. And you just have to bury that. You have to bury it because you have to hope that you know, like that, that you did what you were hired to do. Uh, right. And that's, yeah, but you're more than voice and imposter syndrome voice, man. Always there. Is it stressful? Like, cause you, like you said, you're a guest star actor. You've done guest stars on like some of the craziest shows. Like, is it stressful? Cause like, you're kind of going into somebody else's house, especially established things like Smallville or Supernatural and stuff like that. Yeah. It's, it, it's not it's, so much stress. It's stressful at the beginning. But yeah. again, like I said, like 10 years ago when I was doing it, it was, I was really just there to impress everybody. So I wasn't really thinking about. Right. I probably was maybe like thinking about the character and stuff, but it was more like, I want to show everybody how great I am and I can, we can all work together again. Right. Uh, and, it, and now it's become more about just the work, just going in and making sure I do a good job. Right. Uh, right. So it's less stressful now. Um, and also I think because in recent years, I've been, I've been direct, I've been voice directing a lot. Yeah. So I've been on this other side of it where I work with actors from the other side. Sure. And also, um, again, I can't get into specifics about this, but totally. I've I sold an animated series that me and a couple other guys. Congrats. Wrote. Thanks. So we've been working on that. And so now on this production side, casting actors, uh, finding people to do the music and all that kind of thing. And you start realizing that you're just trying to plug in parts right you know what i mean like you're like i need this character so i need this actor who's going to do this character do it really well not give me any trouble so i can think about the overall picture right and then once you kind of make that connection in your head as an actor you go well that's what i'm going to be for everybody else perfect so i now when i go to a show i go where i have to go i show up on time i have my lines done i listen to direction i do what i'm supposed to do when I rap, I go home. I, I like there's a cast party that I'm invited to, whatever I'll go. But mm. for the most part, it's like I rap, I go home, I come back to work the next day, lines memorized, polite, every, everybody likes, and we all get along. That's all that matters to me. Because sure. the people who are making the show have so much more to think about than whether this guest star actor is going to come in and feel right. <laughs> sure. You know, like they don't care. They want you to do a good job. They hired you. To do a, to do the job that, that you did in the audition, essentially, gotcha. or occasionally, like especially now, I'll get in video games. Especially, I'll get just straight offers to do for you. to do stuff. Uh, but this, it's the same thing applies. It's just they know you're good. They know you're going to do a good job. Just show up and do your job. Right. They've got too many things to think about. You're there to be of service. Yeah, that's really what you are as an actor. You're there to be of service. Do a good job. Beyond be. Uh, 
uh, honest about the character and, and your work, and that's it. And, and I'll ask questions, of course, if I feel like I need answers for a character, sure. but I don't overdo it, uh, especially in voiceover. In voiceover, man, sometimes they just need you to say, like, get down. Right. <laughs> that's it. And they don't need you to go, well, why is this guy... Right. What's what my is, motivation? What grew, what did he grow up with? Yeah. <laughs> to have to say get down like this, like, oh God, please just say get down. What's his relationship with his father like? Yeah. <laughs> like it, you start realizing that when you're on the other side of it, where they're like, just please just say get down. Please. Right. We need to get down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's 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 what I've learned mostly as as I get older. That's what I was would impart to uh, younger actors. It's like you better do a job, just do the job. Be polite. Yeah kind uh listen learn but you're just there to do the job and that's it i love that when you when you started in theater was it like and you wanted to be an actor was it always theater the goal or movies or video games like did you have a theater was i still love theater yeah it just does, it doesn't pay sure and for the time put in it doesn't pay I, when i moved down here i had auditioned for uh uh cory latest play that was oh that was going nice on out here. and I did like three or four auditions and then they called me and they said, look, we loved your work. We want you to uh, understudy the guy we always had in mind for this because that's what theater companies do, right? They have their company of yep. theater and it's rare that they bring other people in, but they try. And I, I, was, I said, oh, okay, I get, uh, will I get a show out of it? They'll say, well, if he gets sick, obviously you'll get more than one show, but you'll be guaranteed one show. And I said, great. And then I switch rehearsal every day from whenever to whenever and you get a stipend because ah, you're an understudy right and i was like i'm sorry what <laughs> <laughs> i know this word. so every time you come in you get like 50 bucks and then mm -hmm. when you do a show you get 250 bucks and this is a pretty big company yeah and i, and I was like guys i can't i can't do that right My Bills. Freaking mortgage is three thousand dollars <laughs> yeah <laughs> like there's no way i'm gonna be able to make a living i have a family sure and uh and also it 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 anchors you to the town so i couldn't go to new york or atlanta or wherever to do a show oh right you can't leave and yeah. and so i was like I, I just can't i can't do it and i wish i could have done it because i miss theater a lot right but because I, I i wouldn't say it's my first love but i grew to very much love live performances yeah that return from the audience can't be yeah that. and just change like I, I i got to play hamlet dude in vancouver what yeah it was it was great and but i the, the interesting thing was we had two months of rehearsal and three weeks of the show oh and i only started getting what i thought was the right place getting to what i thought was the right place in like the second to last show of course of course and, <laughs> and i was like i wish i had three more weeks of this yeah so that's what's great about theater, especially when something is complicated and complex as Hamlet. But with anything, is you just start experimenting with different reactions that you're getting and you start going, hey, man, this is, oh, I like this. I'm going to try to do this next show. Well, that didn't work. I'm going to try to do this now. And then you start really piecing a great performance together. Uh, but with on-camera stuff, like, like I said, especially with me who does a bunch of guest star stuff, it's, I, I go in, I, I do my like I, this second episode of New Amsterdam. I flew up to New York, shot Monday. It was five lines. <laughs> Get it? Did it? Went back to the hotel, fell asleep, and got on a plane and came back. <laughs> That's when you know you're good, you know. Well, I mean, at least you know, like <laughs> the funny thing is, like, wow, I really flew up all the way up here to do like these five lines to basically end my character. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you're like, man, that's a lot of, but that's very different than theater, obviously. Right. It's like you go up, you do your thing and you, you do it very quickly. And then they move on. Like I said, they move on to the rest of the stuff and you're just done. Right. You just go home. There's yeah. no workshopping. Yeah. Especially in TV. In right. film, there's occasionally you'll get rehearsals and things like that. Mm -hmm. Occasionally. But uh, in television, man, especially these network shows. Uh, sure. You show up, you do your thing, and you go back. That's it. Whew. Was there a learning curve involved with that because the mediums are so different? Uh, I, I mean, I'm sure there was. I, I I didn't actively like realize it. I'm sure, sure there was. You know, as I got experience, I just got better at 
showing up doing my thing and going home. Right. I remember my first movie I ever did. After every take, I would ask the director, "Was that okay? Was that okay? Was that good? Anything?" You need? <laughs> and then, like by the third week or second week, he's like, "If I don't say anything to you, it was good." We had like that. the exact same situation. <laughs> first movie, yeah. good, bad, less, more, good, yeah. 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 Moving on is good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. So moving on means we got it. That's yeah. it. Don't worry about it. <sighs> okay. It's all yeah. right. <laughs> so the, in that case, yes, there was a learning curve, but it was like just an experience. Right. Just, just an experience. Yeah. That's good. And how long had you been acting on stage before you made the jump onto screen? Let's see. I did theater school and then I moved. Then I did, we did like two years of plays that I moved to New York where I lived on that floor in Brooklyn mm -hmm. and I did uh, about a year and a half of plays there and then I so like four years four or five years get it and then I did that movie and then once I did that movie the funny thing is now I think about it I did that movie and it paid me like like fifteen thousand dollars or something Ooh, at which the time. At, at the time was like the most amount of money I'd ever seen yeah and now it's like <laughs> oh that's like <laughs> two months of living in LA. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, at the time, it was the most amount of money I'd ever seen. And I took that and moved out to Vancouver. Nice. I shot that in Ottawa and I moved out to Vancouver with that money. And uh, it also didn't last very long. But uh, but from then on, I just did on-camera stuff. And then nice. eventually voiceover stuff. But uh, it was, from then on, I not... Well, I did do Hamlet in Vancouver. But that was the only... I did Hamlet at this play called... Boy's Life or something like that. Not Boy's Life. I don't remember. But this other play, there's like an independent theater company that hired me to do it. Sure. And uh, and then I did a play that the guy who actually wrote the animated series with me, he wrote that play. Oh, we cool. Did that, we did that play in Vancouver too, but that was only like a weekend. So, sure. uh, and we rehearsed at night and stuff like that. So mostly my income was from on-camera stuff. Cool. And it was tough because... Yeah, you don't make a lot in Canada for on-camera stuff. Sure. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of, of days where I'm like, oh, man, I'm running out of money. I'm running out of right. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, then I never looked back. I kind of just did TV and NVO since then. And that's been like, uh, shit, almost 50 years now. Hell yeah. yeah. Coming from on-camera as well. How did you... You did three episodes of Smallville, different characters. Yeah. <laughs> and you see your face. How did you not get Because it was burnt? a different time, man. It was a okay. different time. Okay. Okay. Like, <laughs> like now they would never do that. Right. Because it's all kind of linear. Yes. But in the Smallville, like those days of Smallville, like 10 or 15 or 12 years ago, at least at this point, uh, they were just one offs. Okay. Like every okay. episode was like a villain of the week. Right. And so I would just always, always play these villains. Right. And they knew, like I said, they knew I was a good actor. They knew I'd show up on time. They knew I'd do a good job. So they would, I don't even remember if I auditioned for the last one or Sweet. if they just like called me to have me do it. I think I, I might have, I might have auditioned. I don't really remember. But they would just be like, oh yeah, Elias could do it. So let's just have him come in. And uh, yeah, that's what I would do with, with Smallville. They would bring me in on Smallville to coach actors. That they oh, were what? Hired because they knew I was good. And they're like, he's good. Cool. Let's, have him, let's have him come do that. What and, do you uh, but it was a different time. They would never do that. Right. <laughs> on like Green Arrow or whatever, on uh, Arrow. Right. Or, or the, the new Superman thing. Because once you're on, it's like, that's your character. Right. Right. Uh, Memories are a little longer for some reason. Yeah. I think because of, because of streaming and because of uh, binging. Yeah. So, like, if you binge Smallville, you see me on three times right. over 10 years. <laughs> right. Like completely different characters each time, but, yep. you know. Or the same thing with Law and Order. If you binge, like, Law and Order, you'll see the guy who was the criminal uh, two seasons ago is the lawyer this season. Right. You know, they just, that's just the way they did it. You think I forgot? Mm -mm. But that's, that's changed now, too. That's all changed now, too. Even, even on Law and Order, the character that showed up ten, five years ago is now that same character. Uh, that shows up in the new show. Right. It's, it's a different world. Though. Makes sense. When did you first jump into voiceover then? Uh, in Vancouver, I had 
I've always been, I've always like liked cartoons and wanted to do cartoon voices. But it, well, the interesting thing that happened to me in Vancouver, again, kind of career changing, was I was going in and I had to build myself a demo. Mm-hmm. So I would get all these uh, characters that I made up and I had all different voices and different accents and things like that. And when I was doing the demo, every time we would cut the sound guy, the engineer in Vancouver, and for the life of me, I can't remember his name, and I wish I could because he really changed my career. Every time we would stop and I would just talk to him, he would, not every time, but he would eventually, he eventually said, your natural voice is good. Yeah. And you're putting on all these other voices to get work. And he's like, you should make some of your demo your natural voice. And it hadn't even occurred to me. Sure. Like, it was just like, I'm going to be the crazy voiceover guy. And because he did that, I guess my natural voice ended up on my demo. And that led to, like, some more serious, like, animation and eventually video games. Especially when I I moved back to Montreal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Once I uh, met my wife in Vancouver, we decided, like, she wanted to live in Montreal for a little bit. So I moved back to Montreal. And that's where Ubisoft and Eidos and... Uh, WB and there's like these huge video game companies in there. Sure. So I went there and then I started auditioning for video games there. And that I like, really kicked my voiceover career into like high gear. Cool. Uh, mostly characters that just sounded like me. Right. <laughs> and I had, again, I hadn't even really thought of it. I just thought, well, I'm going to do these crazy characters. I also came in, to be fair, I, I started auditioning. A really interesting time in video games because they were just starting to use actors. They didn't even really know how to pay us. Sure. And there, there wasn't really like motion capture, performance capture wasn't a thing. Like my first game was uh it was Need for Speed Carbon, and we just shot it. Like, oh, yeah. on a green screen. And oh. then my second game was uh Rainbow Six Vegas 2, yeah. where I played the bad guy. And I was had to match my vocal performance to the animator's performance doing the mocap for it. Oh. Because the animators were just doing their own mocap. Right. It was terrible. It was terrible <laughs> mocap. Of course. And I remember saying actors. to them at the time, I'm like, you should get actors to do this. Yeah. Because we were not doing that badly. Right. <laughs> and uh, and then eventually, I think the first one was Splinter Cell. Mm-hmm. Uh, they I did the voiceover, and then I remember. I still remember leaving the booth and they asked me, how tall are you? And I said, I'm like 5'10". Oh. And they said, okay, because you can't be shorter than 5'10 at the time uh, for the computers. I don't know why. They just wouldn't. They couldn't program in anything less than 5'10". Interesting. And I got to play the bad guy. And I went at that time, I went in and matched my own vocal performance with the body performance. Oh, cool. Uh, for COVID separately. And so, yeah, we did it separately. Weird. And that's what I mean by I came in at a really interesting time because it all started merging together. So I've been there since the beginning. Right. I'm learning about all this stuff. And now it's just you go in and you, I didn't even have to shave the last one. I just did one back what? in November. And I, I went in there and I was like, I just did a show. I can't shave everything. And they're like, shave, we don't care. <laughs> the, our cameras are so, like the cameras on the, on the PCAP thing are so, yeah. uh, like, 10 k or something ridiculous yeah that they're like we we can't we it doesn't even matter if you shave because we're capturing the moment of the movement of your face so it doesn't matter what? uh I, I think i guess if you had like a gandalf beard they'd be like can you tone that down right yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> with my facial hair they're like, before i had to shave everything i had to completely like completely clean shave it and now they're like no no it's fine it's fine wow like, oh, it's great so every Every performance capture job is something completely new that, that I'm learning. Uh, but like I said, I've been there from when it was animators doing it. Uh, so it's been a really interesting journey. I, I don't know where it's going to go from here. Yeah. I think eventually it's going to go to where there's no there's no cameras on stage anymore. Like Because uh-huh. uh, right now you go on a mocap stage, there's like 70 cameras. Right. Surrounding your body, surrounding you in the stage that are all capturing the markers on your suit. Right. I think the markers are all just going to program, uh, uh, transmit directly to a computer soon. Ooh, and that'd be cool. Like they're going to have a markerless, or not even the marker, it's just your, the suit itself. 
is going to be a markerless cameraless suit. Right. Just gonna, that's what's coming, I think. How cool uh, we is don't that? Worry about the cameras. But I'm not much of a tech guy, so I don't I don't really know exactly. Sure. Going, but uh, <laughs> magic. That's what's happening. Yeah, it's magic. It's all, it pretty much is magic. <laughs> These guys are crazy. That's so wild. How cool it must be to watch it, like the technology just advance right in front of you. Yeah, I've really seen it advance from from its infancy onto onto where it is now. Wow. And, you know, I don't intend to retire anytime soon, so I can imagine what it's going to be like in ten or fifteen years. Yeah, yeah. that's nuts. And play because you played like the same role in multiple games, like with Federico in Assassin's Creed, and even as Andrea and Splinter Cell, multiple games. It, the technology, I imagine, taking leaps just in between the same characters. And oh yeah, well, like I said, so like uh, like with with Splinter Cell, I'll tell you two stories. Like with Splinter Cell, like I said, that first one, I was ca- I was listening to my voice mm-hmm. and doing the body movements and trying to capture it. Then when we did the sequel, it was full performance capture. I never even saw a microphone. Wow. It was all just on stage, like performance capture the whole character. They even sure. kind of put my face. They tried to, they to put my younger face on older Coleman. Oh, so he kind of looks like me. Get it? Uh, where they didn't do that in the other in the other game. Then the uh, with Deus Ex, the first game, uh, they wanted somebody who is Adam Jensen's actual size, which is six two, mm-hmm. to do the motion capture, not performance capture, just the motion capture. And I'm five ten, right? Uh, and I'm like, I put, they didn't even consider me. So they had somebody else do the motion capture for Adam Jensen. But oh. at that point, they didn't, they didn't have any facial capture. It was just the body. Right. They just did the body. And that kind of pissed me off. And then when the new game, when they called me for the new game, I said, I'll do it, but I have to do the full performance capture for it. Oh, and, smart man. And they said, yes. And they brought me to Montreal and they had, they at that time, even that was like, what, 2014? It's just not that long ago. Well, I guess 10 years ago almost. No, not even. So, 2014 and they were still like messing with stretching me to 62 they were like i don't know if we can add we'll try we have to do tests and i'm glad they did because to me if if you play mankind divided versus human revolution i think human revolution is a better game but mankind mm-hmm. divided the cutscenes are way better and i agree with that like the performances are better and my performance is better. And it's all because we did it all performance capture. Gosh, and it was all just yeah. me doing it rather than two actors trying to get the body in the... Uh, right. Trying to meet in the middle as opposed exactly. to it all coming from the one place. That's why performance capture is better. And uh, that's why I like Mankind Divided. My performance in Mankind Divided better than in Human Revolution. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. How have you kept yourself... Like, because on camera, it's so much of it is trying to put you in a box, right? Yeah. How how have you kept from not being pigeonholed? Because you played good oh, guys, bad guys, all over the place. I have been pigeonholed, but it's it's I, I'll play. I played some good guys and things like that, but for the most part on TV in particular, mm-hmm. I found my wheelhouse. This is one thing that if any younger actors are listening and they want to know what how to make make a living at this, mm-hmm. I, I'm talking like workaday actors, right? Like uh, what you have to do, you have to find your wheelhouse and make your agent submit you for those roles. Mm. Like my agent submits you for almost everything, right? right? But I'll actually turn down auditions if I look at it and go, I'm not going to get cast as this. Sure. Because like, I know what I get cast as. Gotcha. You know so yourself. For, yeah. And I know what I'm good. Like I can play pretty much anything. Right. But I know what I'm really good at. And what I'm good at is bad guys, mm-hmm. jerks, yeah. <laughs> and complex characters you don't trust. Right. That's those are the three things I'm good at. And when I get a breakdown like the uh like uh the episode of FBI that I did. I right. did an episode of FBI a few months ago. Mm-hmm. And uh I remember getting the sides, the breakdown for it and going. I'm either going to book this or I'm going to be in the top three. And I, and there are hundreds of actors auditioning. Right. And why am I so confident? Because it was exactly what I do. Right. Like exactly what it is that I bring to the table as an actor. And, and I knew it, I knew I would be either close or I would, I would get it. And I got it. And, and, 
what, what it's just experience. So I like I'm pigeonholed, but it's almost as out of my own design. Right. Okay. Because okay. I know what because I, I need to pay bills. Because, right. <laughs> like I I didn't turn I didn't turn down oh another bad guy I'm not going to do this. Right. You know I looked at it and go okay this is how I make my living. So yeah I'll do another bad guy. Sure. And it's a breeze now. Like I could go right. in. Like they didn't even give me a friggin' piece of direction on FBI. I just yeah. went and I just did the role. <laughs> And, I, and they're like, great, moving on. Like they, they, they hired me because they know I can do it. I'm going to do a good job. Sure. Uh, and and I, I know that that character and those other characters, like I mentioned, those are the ones that I'm going to come close to booking. Like, I wonder if I can say this. <laughs> I'm just trying to think. Yeah, I, I can say it. I can say it. I had an audition for, I don't know which Star Wars show it was, but it was one of those Star Wars shows, right? Get it. And it was an Imperial officer. Cool. And it may have already come out, so right. I'm probably not going to get in trouble saying it. Sure. <laughs> but I looked at it, I'm like, I'm not going to book this. I'm not right. an Imperial officer. Right. Unless this Imperial officer is a street guy. Right. You sound like you've worked for a living. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to book this guy. Right. Yeah, that's a good example. Good... Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to book, like there was a show Suits that shot up in uh, Toronto when I lived there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm never going to get on the show. I'm never, unless the character is a guy from the streets right? or like, they're not going to give me a role on this. I could do it. If they gave me a role, I could do it. But I know what booking a role takes. Right. So it's a big, it's a difference. There is a difference. Sure. And I would get these roles of like these, uh, like, I don't know, like these uh, guys in suits, these rich businessmen type young mm -hmm. husband type in suits and I'm like unless this guy's like newly rich and doesn't know how to wear a suit yeah <laughs> I'm, not booking, I'm not booking this unless i'm selling these suit guys something that might be less than legal yeah like yeah. i'm not gonna book the the rich white guy type right so i'm not gonna do it sure i i could do it but they're never gonna give me this role right so you start learning about that so this is a long-winded way to answer your pigeonhole question, but yeah. <laughs> I, I love kinda it. did it on purpose because sure. I gotta go, like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get this. This is what I get. So when I came down here and I got an agent, I said, This is what I book. Don't send me for this stuff. You can if you want, and I'll do it if I have time to put myself on tape. But don't get don't be surprised if I don't book this. This stuff, this is what I'll get. Sure. And that's what I learned. And if you go through my resume, like I was watching my demo reel a few months ago, they're like, oh, it's bad guy, bad guy, bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> like jerk. I may have untrustworthy guy. Like, yeah, it's just, but, but you go, this is where my best work is because this is what I do. And I also, if I'm honest, orchestrate my, my demo that way. Yeah. I make it like, well, these are the what I'm strong at. And, Makes sense. And so if you want your bad guy, you hire him. Gotcha. And you start. You start putting yourself in that. Do I, do I hope that somebody comes to me with a complex like character that is not just the bad guy? Always. Always right. be looking for that kind of stuff. But I'm, I'm a working man and I just sure. gotta work. So you end up just kind of pigeonholing yourself. Sure. You know I mean? That makes total sense. Well, I mean, yeah. they say, you know, it's show business, business being the bigger word. And like you've figured that out like the math of it all like this is a tool that i'm really good with what jobs can i do with this tool yeah because at first you're throwing that, that expression like throwing everything into the wall and, and hoping and seeing what sticks right and if i look back at my career i'm like well that sticks that sticks that sticks right so keep throwing the sticky things that makes you sense I mean? yeah yeah did you come to those conclusions yourself or did somebody like help you along and be like this it's is just, what you're good at it's just experience man it's yeah just experience it's it's experience and deduction you just start going well if i keep booking this and i keep right. coming close to this obviously this is what i'm good at right i've and, made money doing this let's do this again <laughs> yeah and i don't it's not to say i don't enjoy it or anything it's just totally like Absolutely. when i went up to did when i did that fbi episode i even do Amsterdam to a degree it's a little less of a bad guy but uh he does some bad things in the show sure uh it's still like fun to go up yeah. and go to set and do it's a great way to make a living of course way but worse ways just, to. yeah it's just i know i know what i'm doing now and it's uh, yeah, of course i hope there's a complex character in my future that i can have fun with but 
I try to make every character complex. I can see it. I can see it. How did the partner come to be? Oh, man. Did you actually watch it? Of course I did. Elias, oh you're, you, you came on my show, all right? <laughs> <laughs> the partner was just fun to me and my, my buddy Pete. And, and again, and the guy who's in it. Yeah. Uh, who uh, plays my brother? If yep. I remember correctly. That's uh -huh. Andreas. He wrote. He's writing the show with me. Yeah. Yeah. Series. Fantastic. Yeah. We just did that at a lark. That's we so cool. We just had fun with that. It cost like five hundred bucks. Get we it. Borrowed the, we borrowed the camera. We. Uh, it didn't really. It didn't all work. It was just an experiment to see I liked it. do something for fun. Yeah, I liked it. It was. It was. It was enjoyable. I only shot it in two nights over at that's my friend Pete's house. Really? And uh, yeah, we just did everything fun. Uh, Dude. I, I Like, I like watching it. I, I wish we could, if we were to ever to do it again, we never will. But if we ever do it again, I'd make a lot of changes with it. But it was sure. just an experiment. That's why I never really promoted it that much because it was more like, and I'm surprised you see it. You saw it. <laughs> oh, dude, it was I more saw just a lot like of a, a, a mark that we just tried to do. <laughs> that <laughs> actually really is, good. to kid you not, that's actually what led to the invite. That's why I wanted to hang <laughs> out with you. Yeah. <laughs> Because like uh, with like Yuri Lowenthal and Tara Platt as well, it's yeah. when you have artists who do it for a living, but also you can tell really just love the art. And like with the partner, when I found out that like you guys made that on your own, just because I'm like, okay, this, there's something here that Elias is my kind of people. And then I saw you right, open yeah, a box yeah. with a hatchet and I was like, yeah, yeah, that send the end. Send the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I love that. And we put Star Trek on. We can never publish it, right? Because we have like the right. music is original, but yep. we have like Star Trek on in the background. Yeah. Like so I'm not paying for the rights. So it's just for fun. Of course. Speaking of yeah. that, because I know you're a big Star Trek fan. Huge. How have you have you been able to come down from signing the golden book with William Shatner? Uh, you know what's really funny? This sound is I'm playing with the pen they gave me. Uh, oh the pen from look. Montreal. It says Ville de Montreal on it. What? Uh, yeah, they gave me a pen and a plaque when I signed that thing. Uh, Dude. That was a big imposter syndrome. Thing. I it have to be. Really. That was like, because it was it was me and Shatner and Michael Ironside and Brent Spiner and, and uh, who else was there? Elias. The only ones I was like, yeah, see? <laughs> see what I mean by the... Uh, <laughs> Don't worry, I got you. You're not getting away from this. <laughs> um, there was somebody else that he was in a bunch of Doctor Who episodes. He's really he's way more popular than me. I'm forgetting his name though. I didn't I didn't know him specifically, mm -hmm. but he's really popular. But there were all these guys and we're signing this book and the mayor's there and, and uh we're giving speeches and stuff like that. Uh that was that was weird. Yeah. <laughs> but, but really, really the mayor just happened to be a, a big fan of my work. Cool. Like he just had followed. If it wasn't like if he wasn't the elected mayor, I would never have been given this like honor. But he was a big fan of my work, and he's like, I'm honoring. You know, Shatner's going to be there. Iron says we were all there for the Comic Con, for yeah. the Montreal Comic Con, and we're we're getting everybody to sign that. Can you do you want to come in and sign? And uh, I was like, Yeah, dude. So that was that was pretty surreal. I met the Shat Man a few times. Yeah. Uh, He's always been very nice to me. Good. Yeah, that helps. People have stories about him, but I've always, I found him to be a, a gentleman, attentive. Uh, the first time I met him, we talked about Montreal because he grew up there too. Oh, cool. Yeah, we grew up in literally the same neighborhood. Dude. Yeah, and so I would talk about the neighborhood and he was very attentive and nice and cool. And yeah, that was the only time I had ever been starstruck in my life. I bet. I was just a big Star Trek fan. Yeah, how could you not? Yeah, and I and I just like Shatner in particular. Like I just grew up on yeah the old show and the movie Star Trek Two. Like I know every like every sound and frame of that film. I know by heart, and uh, I, I adore it. And so meeting Shatner was like, oh my god! And and I don't That's get cool. starstruck. I worked with a whole bunch of actors. Yeah, and I, it's just work. But sure. Shatner, he's like on another level for me. So I was right. really. I <laughs> he's was from like, space. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was really at the in the moment where it was just a conversation. Sure. But when I when I remember leaving and texting Andrew, actually, Andreas, and texting him and going, oh my God, I'm shaking. 
like I'm like shaking and my I didn't realize that that was happening to me because I was so excited to meet him yeah um, then the, like subsequent times that all went away and it just became like oh hey no like sure that kind of thing not that, cool, not that cool. he recognized me every time right He's like, oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta meet a thousand people a day i get it exactly when you're doing uh like assassin's creed right yeah and you get to play leonidas yeah how much of that like when you're going into a role that has become such a big thing in like pop culture with like gerard butler's how much freedom did they give you and how much reference did they give you? They didn't give me any reference. I booked it based off of, uh, they had me do other speeches in a Greek accent. Like I did oh, one cool. Aragorn speech from Lord of the Rings. What? Yeah, that was like, that's what they would do for, for the audition. Cool. And then when they gave it to me, I knew the writer, Daniel, like he and I knew each other from Montreal. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, let's just not do anything that would harken back to, to the 300 movie sure but let's just try not to do that right there's some things you can't avoid you're fighting for sparta so you gotta do that sure but i think the speech they wrote was really good agreed and, and uh it was a lot of fun to do it it's funny because you see it it looks like there's 300 soldiers and there's like six stuntmen yeah actually <laughs> on the day but they're all magic. really cool yeah uh yeah that was that was a lot of fun and again I know Ubisoft's getting a lot of shit these days, but man, they, artistically, they're the best. Like, yeah. they were really good with me with Phoenix and with Assassin's Creed. I, um, they, they had me come in and they had me play Leonidas. And then they had me do a, but they didn't tell me or they mistaken or I misunderstood, but they had me play Nicolaus. Oh. And uh, the father of the, of the main character. Right. And what I didn't know at the time was I thought they gave me both characters, but they actually were just using me as a performance capture placeholder for Nicolaus, and they were going to oh. replace my voice. Oh. But then they loved what I was doing with Nicolaus, so they said, we're going to replace your Leonidas voice. Oh. And I was like, oh, don't. <laughs> like, I gave so much to that Leonidas. Like, it was, we did Leonidas first. Right. And then we did with Nicolaus. And I was like, don't, don't. I gave so much to the United States. Don't. Like, yeah. And then Nicolaus, like, I love him too. He's great. Don't replace his voice either. Right. <laughs> and, but they were like, no, no, no we got to replace one. And then I wrote the game director an email. I was like, look, man, I'll come in and I'll re record some stuff for no cost if you let me play both. Oh. And to their credit, they didn't even have me come in. They just let me play both. Dude. They were just like, screw it. If his voice sounds similar, his voice sounds a little similar. Wow. Uh, and they let me play both. And again, like, Ubisoft's always been the best to me, man. Like, How I can't, cool is like, that? I can't never complain about Ubisoft. They've just always been cool with me. Man, you can't get burned in games. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> As proven. That is wild. How many times have you died? On TV? On TV, games, you've died in every media. Well, I games, think. like, you could kill Adam <laughs> Jensen a hundred times. But, right. Uh, a lot. A yeah. lot. I don't know what I mean. I did put together, I lost it recently, but I did put together, like, a death reel of my oh, TV deaths. Oh, sweet. And it, it was still, like, two minutes long. <laughs> so it was just, like, death after death after death for two minutes. Uh, Do you have a favorite? Oh, The Expanse, for sure. You gotta the be. The way I died in The Expanse is, like... Where it like, gets grabbed. And yeah. Also, I did a movie called Sand Serpents, which is not a great, not a great film, but yeah. we, really, <laughs> we shot it in Romania. It was a lot of fun. What? And uh, on my birthday, I got eaten by a giant sand, ser sand serpent. What? So they had me on a on a like a pulley, like a rig where they yank me back. Uh, <laughs> so that was fun. That was a fun death. Uh, but yeah, I think the expanse. I love yeah. the expense all, together, all the way through. I loved working on it. I loved everybody there. Everybody was cool. I still talk to them. Cool. You got uh, robot eyes. I mean, I got robot eyes. And then I did it. the, uh, in the second and third season, I played, I did performance capture for the pro molecule creature. Yeah. And so I got to do two more seasons of that show, even after my character died. Dude, which is really, killing it. Which was really fun. I mean, we did those seasons in like four days, but sure, <laughs> but because uh, it was all on one stage, right? But I still got to go see everybody and act the scenes out with them. It was really, yeah, it was a lot of fun. 
How cool is that? Is there something that you haven't been able to do yet that's still on like your acting bucket list? I mean, everybody wants to do. I mean, there's just tons, man. Yeah. I'm, I'm, like, of course, I'm really all happy with my career and all this kind of stuff. But, sure. You know, you you, you want to like. You know, I can't watch Book of Boba Fett and not go. I can play that guy. Right. Why did I play that guy? <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, there's a perfect example in Book of Boba Fett. The Timothy Oliphant, uh, yep, deputy sheriff. Uh -huh. He's only in that one episode. Yep. But I remember looking at that guy and going, "Why did I even audition for that? I should have right? audition." Right. <laughs> I would like, be so good at that. I would have killed that. <laughs> he was fine. He was great. But I would have been like great at that guy. Right. Uh, I've died so many times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know. So yeah, you look at shows like that. You're like, I wish I could do this. I wish I could do this show. And I really want. What I really want to do next i think is something like like yellowstone oh yeah some very serious non-network drama hell yeah because i've been doing so many network shows that i kind of right. want to move over to like give me some some show that's a season long of a character growth like the expanse was right you know like something like that i want to do again That'd be cool. Uh, I haven't done that in a while because COVID shut a lot of stuff down. Right. So I have been going like guest star to guest star to guest star. Sure. So I definitely would love to do something like a long character arc again on a on a cool show like Yellowstone or or, or 1883, which is Yellowstone anyway. Yeah. Somewhere you uh, can just sit and like actually watch an arc kind of thing. Yeah. I, I, I haven't done an arc on show in a while because, because of COVID. Sure. Sure. You know, I get to do arcs in like Blood of Zeus and uh, yeah, you do things like that. So. <sighs> Show's nuts. Yeah, I love that show. We're, I don't, I don't know when we're recording, but soon, very soon. Yeah, my stuff for season two. Yeah. How has directing been? It's been fun, man. It's a lot of fun. It's uh, it's interesting because I'll go from directing like inexperienced actors on a game like out of China. Uh huh. Uh, not the actors are all in America, but the game is like out of China. They're casting the English voices, right? So it's like a bunch of inexperienced actors, and then the next we working with like uh, Dave Fennoy or Maurice Lamarche or like right. these actors who are legends in the business who I look up to. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to direct you, dude. I'm not really going to direct you. I'm just right. going to tell you what the that the game or the show is about, and you do your thing. Right. The only, honest to God, like I had uh, Neil Kaplan, who was a legend in, in the yeah. voiceover. Uh, I was directing him the other day, or Tara Platt. I was directing her the oh, other day. Amazing. Uh, but I had Neil Kaplan yesterday. We were doing a game, and uh, I don't. You don't really direct guys like him. Right. <laughs> you kind of just tell them what the situation is, and if they get the situation wrong, you just remind them of the situation. Right. Like, I don't really go like, well, could you pull on this word and, and like take this? Word? You really just go, uh, there's a lot more noise because the plane's crashing. Yeah. Like, that's really all you do. <laughs> that's really all you do with, with big guys, like with experienced guys like that. Tara sure. was the same way. Incredible. And, uh, you know, I don't really direct her. I just go like, okay, we have to be a little quiet because the, the monster's around the corner or whatever. Right. You know, that's really all I do. Uh, but then you get to, less experienced actors and you have to guide them and sometimes mold them into good performances which is uh, which is another interesting challenge yeah uh, but i've been doing it for a year now and i really like it that's cool do you find that experience is the thing that like separates a lot of the actors as far as the work goes well here's the thing let's let, let, let's <laughs> let's end on this type of thing that i'm going to say this yes. advice that i'm going to say to uh to actors yes which is kind of contrary to what everybody's always said. Uh huh. And it's this. Let, I, have to pre, I have to preface it. I'll preface <laughs> it like this. I love comic books, right? Same. Uh, I've grown up loving comics. I saw Batman yesterday. I thought it was great. Mm -hmm. uh, giant, giant comic book fan. I cannot draw a circle. Right. I could take 10 years of art classes and I will never be a great artist. Mm hmm. I will be somebody who's trained really well. Maybe I can draw a little bit, but I'll never be a great artist in terms of drawing or painting. Sure. It's just something I, it's not in me. I told you earlier, I love hockey. Not mm -hmm. a great skater. Yeah. <laughs> I could practice forever. I will be an okay skater and I will never crack the major leagues. Right. Only in acting 
do people go, if you believe in yourself, you can make it. <laughs> as if it isn't a skill. As, as if it isn't a skill. Yeah. And I'll give them, the, I'll actually ask this, this 10% of that, which is if you're really pretty or really yep. handsome, you could eke out a living or make a good living as an actor because it is a visual medium. Right. Right. But if you inherently aren't a good actor, you will not make a living at this. Sure. No matter how much you believe in your dreams. Yeah. And I always hated when people said that. <laughs> I always hated when people were like, if you believe in yourself, you could be a giant star. Oh. You know, like even short, even Schwarzenegger was like, I'm going to be the biggest actor in the world. And he's not a great actor, but he turned, he did, what he did was he said, I'm going to find out what I'm good at and I'm going to do that. Right. So he said, I'm good at this. People hire me for this. I'm going to do this. And then he tries other performances and things like that because he's a giant star now. Right. But he made it based on a, based off of this is what I'm good at. I know I'm good at this. He's not going to go try to get a drama. Right. <laughs> there, nobody's going to cast him. It, it is early career, I mean. Sure. Like, th- nobody was going to be like, let's cast Arnold Schwarzenegger as Shakespeare play. Right. Like they're just not going to do it because he doesn't have it. He can't do that. Right. I can't do what he does. Right. You know what I mean? So for me, it's like, just know if you're good, know what it is you're good at. Yeah. And do that. I, I got a friend who loves movies, loves acting, loves everything exactly the same amount that I do. He's not a good actor. Right. He just inherently is not a very good actor. Sure. He went to theater school with me. He has the exact same amount of training I do, just inherently not very good. He never works. And he just stopped. He realizes like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna book this. I'm not gonna book any work. It's just not gonna happen. Right. And he's like my one of the example, like a model of this guy loves it just as much as me. He's as passionate as I am. Why did I why was I able to make a living at it and he wasn't? And it's solely because of the innate talent that you have for whatever. Sure. And just recognizing that talent. Uh, that's what you have to be able to do. And, and so anytime a young actor comes up to me and asks me, like, what would you, what do you want to do? Well, how do you, how do, how do I do what you do? Or how do I, how do I get, is it just experience? Is it, is it uh, drive? Is it ambition? Yes. That's all in there. Of course you need drive and you need ambition, all that kind of stuff. But if, <laughs> you know Glenn Gary Glenn Ross? Do you know that uh-huh, play uh-huh. from the movie? Yep. There's a, a scene in the play or the movie where one of the one of the salesmen, I, I don't know, I think he says, I can't do it if I don't have the goddamn leads. Yeah. <laughs> like if I don't have the leads, I can't sell. And that's always, always something I think of is like if you don't have the talent for it, sure, you're not gonna be able to do it in anything. Right. Not just acting in anything. And there's a lot of things I love, but I can't, I'm never going to be able to do them. Uh, You just have to make that, you have to accept it and go like, this is what I'm good at. So my point is, if you know you're a good actor or not even like a good actor, you know, you can act. If you know you can do it, then get training, then go do it and you will work. But if you are not good, you won't work. It's just the way it is. Sure. Honestly, that's important to know. And so the follow your dreams thing always kind of bothers me. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I appreciate that. And I like when people, especially it being a business, like it's important to know those things and to be honest about it. And I, I actually, I, I like that. I, yeah. think th- I think that's cool. And for that, dude, we've been talking for over an hour. No, dude, I didn't even realize. Elias, you survived. <laughs> <laughs> if I had medals, I'd give them out. Thank you. Dude, this has been great. You are a joy to hang out with. Uh, thanks, man. It's been super cool. Yeah, it's been fun. I haven't done a podcast in a while, too. Before I release you into the wild, I got to ask, where can people find your stuff? Where can they find you online? Oh, this is another thing I hate about being an actor. <laughs> <laughs> Promotion. Just say the um, internet. <laughs> the, the inter- no, I, I mean, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Like, I don't do Instagram that much. I'm mostly sure. Twitter and Instagram. I have a Facebook page. But it's all for unabashed, blatant self-promotion. Yeah. <laughs> the only reason I'm there. And it's not to feel good. It's just so I can get more people. It's actually got me work, you know, Twitter. And oh, stuff good. 
gotten me not so much gotten me work, but it's gotten me like Comic Cons and things like that. So I there's another thing I would say to actors is use that social media properly to promote yourself. Smart. It's part of uh, it's part of the business. I'm very business these days. I think as you should be. I get older. <laughs> I'm less about the passion of it and more about the business. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, it's working. <laughs> I also really um I really, really dislike actors who take themselves, take their art too seriously. Uh-huh. Like anybody who says like, uh, <laughs> like what we do saves lives. <laughs> <laughs> like sure, it touches people and it's great. Like like Henry V completely changed my life. Yep. But, you know, it's like don't, it don't can. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> but when you say it, nah, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Twitter, Instagram, your Elias two fixes on both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Smart man. yes. See, I'll, I'll help you out. We got this. And. Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. There you'll find my demos, films, and a bunch of other really fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to pick you up some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly and get early releases of the shows, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Daryl, Daz, Ben, Victor, and Chris. Your support means so, so much to me, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.